Yeah, I'm Dr. Gloria Lattimore Peace, host and producer of Omniu Presents, the H3O Art of Life show. I was kind of thinking that maybe I wasn't the host and producer of this show because the light went out. Mm -hmm. But I'm wanting to explain to you why I'm wearing shades. My uh, reading glasses are broken, mm -hmm. and so I need something on my on my face to help me see where I'm driving. So these are <laughs> prescription sunglasses that I'm wearing while I'm waiting to get more <coughs> lens. But this is a continuation. It really should have been called Artistry and Culture Part Two, mm -hmm. because actually Kalan Phil Koran, who was my guest along with his fellow artists in the show of that title, actually introduced the topic that we want to discuss. Mama Edie is here. She's a storyteller. and She'll tell you more about herself because she has this long, long biography. She's been doing a lot of things for a long time. And she's, she expressed to me an interest to discuss the topic. We all share an interest in, in the, the topic of communication, language, um, and well, we should, because language is the cement of culture. It is what ties it together, holds it together, and makes it transmittable. And so I'm just very happy that it just, you know, the good fortune to have Kalan Phil Koran as part of this mm -hmm. conversation could not have been a better uh, blessing. So, Mama Edie, tell me why you, you wanted to come to discuss this topic with us. Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you so much mm -hmm. um, for having me. And, um, and I thank you also for all the work that you've done over so many years. Mm -hmm. um, and it actually has everything to do with why uh, I was interested in having this conversation with you. I'm very keenly aware that visibility plays a big part mm -hmm. in what is happening and what is not happening mm -hmm. that maybe needs to be happening for our people. And sometimes when we don't hear about the good work and when we can't see evidence of the good work that's being done, then it's easy to assume that it's not happening. Mm -hmm. And then people become discouraged. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then sometimes people lose motivation. Mm -hmm. Who am I? I'm only one person. It's so hard <coughs> and nobody else is out there doing it. Well, when we can see programs like yours where we are communicating mm -hmm. to each other and we are making visible the people like Baba, Kalan, mm -hmm. Phil, Koran, mm -hmm. and, um, and all the artists and so mm -hmm. many people who mm -hmm. are making contributions. That is in itself a form of communication. So mm -hmm. you are helping us to communicate mm -hmm. um, and making visible the good work that's being done. At its core, I suppose, well, I should explain that my training in school uh, at the university, I went to Northern Illinois University in DeKalb, mm -hmm. and I was there from 69 mm -hmm. to 73. And my training was as a speech and language pathologist. Mm -hmm. And especially at that time, at that university and at many other universities, pursuing an area like speech pathology or audiology mm -hmm. was a challenge, not only because of the subject matter. And I had never seen myself as a science wizard, mm -hmm. um, but there was an awful lot of science involved, the right. science of sound. Mm -hmm. um, we had to study about um, sound and how sound is transmitted through the mm -hmm. ear. So we had to learn anatomy mm -hmm. of the body. We had to learn neuroanatomy mm -hmm. and how all the different parts of the body communicate with each other mm -hmm. in order to allow us to function mm -hmm. and to live and be productive. But at many of our universities, the psycho-emotional support was not there. Right. 
In fact, I was told by the director at that time when I was called into his office uh, in my junior year, so I'm almost ready to graduate, right? That, uh, well, my grades weren't too bad, but you know, speech pathology, audiology, those really are not areas for black people. Have you ever mm -hmm. considered social work? <laughs> First of all, I was stunned and I went into denial mode because it's like, what did he just say? You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> and I couldn't believe that he had said that. And casting no aspersions on social workers. Uh, social work is a fine profession, especially if we practice it honorably. And in fact, I had intended to be a social worker uh, when I first got into school. I wanted to help solve everybody's problems. Mm -hmm. But that was not the field that I ended up choosing. <clears throat> and for someone to tell me that my selection of a profession was not for black folk, it gave me a myriad of emotions. It made me angry. It made me shocked. It hurt my feelings. It did all those things, but the main thing it did was made me determined that I was going to prove him wrong. And so I stayed. And it was at a time when many people were frustrated not only out of the speech pathology department and the audi audiology programs, but frustrated right on out of school altogether. And this happened around many universities around the country. And when uh, it was also during the same time that we began rallying for black studies programs. And it was at that time, if you remember, this was the time 1969 and what have you, many of the countries in Africa had just started within the past 10 years, had just begun to get their so-called independence from the European powers. Mm -hmm. Subsequently, more continental Africans were in a position to then begin to come to the United States to send their children here to study. Subsequently, here we were in a position where we could actually meet each other for the first time. We were meeting brothers and sisters from Kenya and from Nigeria and from Ghana and from Ethiopia. I almost married a man from Ethiopia, but that's another story. But <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it was wonderful. It was so exciting for us to be able to come together to communicate realities to each other as compared to the images of the Tarzanisms that had been <laughs> communicated to us that were strongly suggested as our reality. And that was a frustrating concept. And when you consider, if I can stay on that for just a moment, when you consider when we were children growing up and those images of Tarzan had black people who had so much uh, paint and what have you, uh, makeup on their faces, that you really couldn't see their features. You couldn't see the beauty in their eyes. You couldn't see the intelligence in their expressions because those things didn't matter. They simply represented the Africans in Tarzan's jungle. And when the people were being invaded, say by another village or another culture, you didn't see the elders coming together to discuss a plan, what should we do, and then coming up with a plan? No, they were waiting for this little white boy raised by monkeys to come swinging through the trees, beating on his chest to save the day. Now, who would want to relate to that? And within those kinds of images that had been promoted, it made it very, very difficult for black folk to want to connect with being African. And as a matter of fact, and I know that you recall, if, if somebody called themselves signifying or really putting somebody down, oh, you just look like an old African. I ain't no African. The response should have been, thank you very much. But we didn't know enough to be able to respond that way because all we knew was Tarzan. We knew Tarzan and we knew happy slaves singing in the cotton field, singing Old Black Joe. 
And it was difficult for us to want to connect with any of that. Subsequently, the potential for us to communicate with actual people from the continent helped us to share our actualities, our actualities, uh, our realities with each other. And it was during this time that I began to notice, the more I listened to them, that there were some common features in the way they spoke that I heard in the way we spoke mm -hmm. as black folk in the United States. And I said, wow, that's really interesting. There must be something to this. And so I decided to go to the university library. Well, that's a, a, a logical plan. But when I went there, I couldn't find anything. I couldn't find anything. And there was a young lady there, young white girl who worked in the, the library, who was very nice. And um, she felt sympathetic. And I told her what I was interested in studying. And she said, you know, I think I found a book that, that might be helpful to you. We went down a long corridor, down some back stairs, down into, I felt like we were going into the catacombs. Mm -hmm. And we get down to these dusty shelves where apparently nobody hardly ever goes anymore. And she practically had to blow the dust off of this particular book and she pulled it out. She said, I think you might find some information in here. That was my turning point. And at dinner, maybe that night um, in the dormitory, I mentioned this experience. I asked the other students at my table, I said, you know, I had an interest in trying to find out some information on the communication systems and the, the way Africans, continental Africans use language. And I've started noticing some similarities in the way we speak, the way we pronounce our words and the way we hold our heads and even the nonverbal uh, expressions. I was seeing myself reflected in my brothers and sisters from across the continent who I'd never met before. And I said, but I went to the library to try to get some information about it. And I told them the experience as I described it to you. And I said, but this is ridiculous. Have any of you all had any difficulty trying to find information that you've wanted? And one by one, they were saying, yeah, I wanted to find out some information about black folk and this. And another one said, I wanted to find out some information about that. And we weren't finding it. And that was when we said at that dinner table, you know, there's something we need to do about this. And so we did begin the process, uh, wrote a letter to the university president and said that our parents are taxpayers, this is a state university, and we need to have access to some information that can inform us about who we are. Because when we were children being raised up, we learned about everybody in the world but us. And then if you got lucky and you had the wherewithal to search out on your own, then you might have come across a little something. And of course, <coughs> uh, most of us know the history of, of the challenges that we went through in trying to get those black studies programs established uh, to the point where we ended up having to sit in uh, at the, uh, on the stairs of the administration building and block the way because the president kept putting us off and you know, I'd call him back and oh, he's busy and oh, he's out of town. And so finally we just said, well, we'll just wait right here till he's unbusy. And uh, then once we got, we did get our program, we got it authorized, we got our program started at Northern, and people at other universities started contacting us and saying, how did you do that? Would you come here and discuss it with us? And as we would drive in caravans of three or four cars to other universities, it was as though the police knew that we were coming and they usually stopped us on the road where are you going so we got harassed and, and that kind of thing so it was it was quite an interesting time the struggle to establish and require that our right to information about ourselves be honored be acknowledged and be responded to and as a result um, communication has been uh, of major importance to me ever since, not only in terms of 
being able to learn more about myself as a child of African descent and, and how we can communicate through our languages with each other, but also relative to the point that, as you had mentioned earlier, that language is what binds cultures together. Well, what binds cultures together are the relationships of the individuals within the culture. And even in households, when the communication breaks down, so does the family. And when the family breaks down, so does the culture. And when these various cultures break down, so does the nation. And there are many things I think that um, we, it would be good for us to consider a little bit more often as we communicate with each other. Something as simple, seemingly as simple as timing, uh, such that if there is, uh, when, when I'm doing parent workshops and even teacher workshops, sometimes I like to use the example of a woman who is at home and has discovered that maybe her husband didn't do something that he had promised to do and he'd been promising to do or if he had uh, committed some infraction there in the home and just wait until he gets home. I'm going to wear him out. And then the husband comes in, comes at the door, and then she looks at him and he's just looking like he's been whooped by the outside world. So the question becomes, what's important at that moment? Is it important for her to establish her anger, to vent her anger at this man who has apparently already been challenged and somewhat whipped out in the street? Or might it be a better idea to just give the brother a little time? Just let them get in here, catch his breath, even if she's angry with him, just go to him and give him a hug, even in her anger. Just get over it for a few moments, go to him and give him a hug. Baby, what happened today? Well, just you know, that I'm, little bit of sweetness. I'm sitting you know? here in this chair and I'm about to levitate <laughs> <laughs> because um, I had not the same experience when you were called into the office to mm -hmm. to tell you that uh, speech pathology was not a discipline for black people mm -hmm. and of course the undertone to that is black people have speech problems and therefore they wouldn't recognize a speech problem in another black person if they heard it because they're so they're so um, it's, it's such a common thing. It's, they're so accustomed to it. I actually had a black professor at a junior college who was a speech pathology teacher who had been indoctrinated with that kind of, that kind of, mm -hmm. of uh, nonsense. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, Kalan, mm -hmm. I had gone to Willard School and had a bevy of black teachers and one of the things that we were introduced to and taught to learn as they say by heart mm -hmm. was the poetry of Paul Ernst Dunbar. Mm -hmm. And so I was not only proud of who I was, mm -hmm. but I was proud of the natural speech of black people. Mm -hmm. I loved it. Mm -hmm. And whenever I heard any expression that came from out of a region yeah. that, you know, like Miss, you say we were born in Mississippi. Right. When <laughs> I heard somebody want to go, had to go and make groceries. Yeah, right. <laughs> there you go. I, because you have said this, yeah. it expresses your experience right. and your reality. And consequently, to have somebody try to shut that down and try to make you ashamed of this it is, is such an affront until I detested my teacher for bringing me all this literature that talked about the sing song quality of the language when I should have been saying, as you said, when somebody says you look like an African, thank you very much, 
I didn't realize we sang mm -hmm. when we spoke. Right. I didn't know I didn't know how to be proud of it. I knew how to be angry mm -hmm. when somebody attacked it. Mm -hmm. But that has been <clears throat> our experience. Our experience has been that they have misnamed and nicknamed, call it Ebonics, the natural speech of our people. Mm -hmm. How dare you give it some something that you coin like a product that you have on a shelf in a grocery store. You know, and why is it that we don't understand as, as in, um, in uh, Raisin in the Sun, when, when she said, this plant expresses me, this language expresses me, this language tells me that I am a part of a kinship group of other people who share my experience, who share my values, from whom I have descended, about whom I am not only proud, but I am, am enamored of those people. So that in the first place, we need to just get with the notion that when someone attacks your speech, they are attacking your person, mm -hmm. It's the same as being called, as they say, the N-word, which I'm not afraid of, but I don't want to offend some viewers. Mm -hmm. It's the same as being called out of your name to have any part that is natural to you, mm -hmm. especially for the length of time that we have had language. We are the originators mm -hmm. of language. Mm -hmm. It belongs to us. Other people take what we have, and they manipulate it and modify it and turn it into something that they can use for their own benefit. You know, um, there has been controversy um, among speech and language pathologists uh, or uh, different, different modes of thought, if you will, to kindly put it, among speech pathologists for a long time. Uh, relative to the appropriateness of uh, black dialect, of the, the way we speak but black language. Mama well, Edie. but see, the thing is, the thing is, didn't you just talk about somebody who had been so well indoctrinated? Mm -hmm. He wasn't by himself. I'm sure. It's a whole bunch of folk been well <laughs> indoctrinated. And until we as individuals can learn to see the beauty in our natural state, then we will continue to support the posture of the status quo. Okay. And, um, and what happens is that you've got what people frequently refer to as standard English, and then Ooh, what standard. people used to say substandard English. And what the way they often define standard English, it's, I mean, it's so subjective. But when you hear people try to define it, what they say is that it is the language structure and diction that is frequently used, well, you can't say diction in the newspapers, but it's the language structure that's generally used in newspapers and um, on the news on television. So those patterns that are, that are used. However, that was before black folk got on TV <laughs> and started doing the news. And interestingly enough, even a lot of the black people who are on television doing the news and what have you, they can know how to, uh, to use so-called standard English, but their naturalness, if they are natural folk, then their natural intonations and inflections are going to come through. And you can see clearly those who are very comfortable with it and those who are straining the nerve to try to keep from going there. Now, one of the beauties of our flexibility is being able to switch code. We are so versatile and so flexible, we can use whatever it is that we need to use, whatever seems to suit the purpose at any given moment. Uh, one of the things that, um, one of my postures, for example, about hair is that black folk have, I mean, we know that we've got a lot of different kinds of textures of hair among us. However, most of us have good, strong, thick, rich hair that grows towards the sun. It doesn't lay limp, you know, it, it just, it's got, it's got body, 
It's got life and it reaches for the sun. Well, folk can do whatever they want to do with their hair. But the sad thing for me is when a person has not learned to see the beauty in their natural hair to the point that they never allow that naturalness to be seen. I spoke with a sister not too long ago who said that um, her mother began giving her, well, we used to call it permanent, uh, the relaxer, when she was four years old. And ever since that time, she had relaxer in her hair. And it had occurred to her, I think she might be in her maybe in her early 40s now, something like that. It occurred to her, I think maybe somewhere in her 30s, that she had not seen her natural hair. And it had gone beyond the time when she should have her touch up. And she started seeing the new growth that was coming out. And she became fascinated by it. So she decided to just let it grow out a little bit more. And then the more she saw, the more she liked it. And then she decided, to take the relaxer out, and she has never gone back to straightened hair anymore. Now, I mentioned that because there are so many things that communicate. There are so many circumstances and situations that say something about who we are, what we believe, how we see ourselves, um, what kind of level of self-esteem do we have. So when that sister let the relaxer, all those chemicals grow out of her hair. She was saying to the world, here I am. And I feel good about who I am. Now, when we can get to the pl place where more of us can feel good about who we are, how we look, when we can become more comfortable with who we are in our own skin, and many of us, after all, 2009, it distresses me sometimes to think about how many people are still struggling with learning how to be comfortable in our own skin. When we cannot do that, we end up having all these hangups and insecurities that block our minds and get in the way of our being able to focus on things that are really important. But it's not, it's not accidental. It is of very course not. deliberate. Of course not. The whole program. Malcolm X said, the mm -hmm. worst thing mm -hmm. we ever learned from white people was to hate ourselves. Yes. So that this, this program of indoctrinating our people with this contempt for everything that represents them, mm -hmm. causing them to do exactly what you're saying. They want to process their hair. They want to process their speech. They want to process everything about them and seek a white standard of beauty because we have internalized this notion mm -hmm. that somehow we are inferior to people who are not black. Mm -hmm. And consequently, this is, a, this is an ongoing thing. People talk about emancipation, and they talk about the end of chattel slavery. It's not over. It's not. This is constant and continuous, and it comes in every form. Yes, it's it every does. form of communication. Whatever it is carries this er undercurrent, if it is not the direct message, mm -hmm. to cause us to have contempt for ourselves and therefore contempt for, for other people. We don't switch codes, Mama Edie. We're mm -hmm. bilingual. Mm -hmm. We are bilingual mm -hmm. within the English language. Mm -hmm. We speak two forms of English. Mm -hmm. The problem is we are so readily um, able to accept that we should surrender one of them. I mm -hmm. will never mm -hmm. surrender my mm -hmm. ability mm -hmm. to speak in my natural speech mm -hmm. in those situations where that is the thing that I desire to mm -hmm. do. It doesn't matter whether it's appropriate mm -hmm. to do it. Mm -hmm. If I desire mm -hmm. to speak, and I'm, I don't let everybody have that degree of familiarity there with me. Is. I'm, there you know, if you're the insurance agent and, and you're not one of ours, then just expect that I am formal with you and I expect mm -hmm. you to be formal with me. Mm -hmm. I, we're not going to get on the buddy-buddy, mm -hmm. you know, we're not 
homies and we're not going to high five. We're mm -hmm. not going to do any of that. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying that we must embrace who we are. We must not acquire 15 languages. We are the people of language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Speak English, speak standard English, mm -hmm. speak French, mm -hmm. speak whatever, whatever language you, you need to speak. Mm -hmm. If you go someplace where a language is common and you need to know some of it or enough of it at least to navigate the, the uh, environment, mm -hmm. learn to speak it. But don't ever ever, ever surrender what you already have. The gifts that you already have are yours. Mm -hmm. So if you take on another, another form of expression, understand that you are taking on this tool because this tool will be used for this purpose. Don't get, don't lose yourself mm -hmm. in the process of doing mm -hmm. it. It it's is true, it is it's true. Brother Kalan, rescue us we I trying can. to have this <laughs> we trying to well first of all the conversation is going the wrong way for me <clears throat> all right well let's because redirect i can't relate to it as a black man all right uh even the little things i could go back and pick over a little but but most of all being trained in uh the institutions of america is to to become a slave i don't care how well you're trained and i don't care where you're trained you become a tool of the dominant society when you matriculate in these universities. So I said, if you've got a mind, why do you need to go and have your enemy teach you? Mm -hmm. Why don't you use your mind to learn things on your own? I started out, actually, of course, I was fortunate enough to have parents to send me to the better institutions. It just so happened that when I was in my second year as a chemistry major and a math minor, I had excellent teachers. I've spoken of them before. Um, they were very good, but they were trained by Europeans. And then my, uh, my chemistry teacher had received his degree under Enrique Fermi. The same year that I entered his class, he had just got his PhD. His name was Marty D. Taylor. And my math teacher, uh, Dr. Walter R. Tabbert, got his PhD at 22 under, at Princeton under Einstein. And so I had some pretty nice teachers, you understand? But uh, the ancestors saved me. My mother and my father's uh, grand, uh, stepfather split up, so I had to leave school because I didn't want to ask him to pay for my schooling, although he was well-to-do. I just felt that it wasn't his job. I didn't feel anything. In fact, I helped him when he was older and all of that. But I just felt that I didn't want to go and work a job because I had to five, study five hours a day for my chemistry alone. And so I didn't want to try to work a job and pass and thing like this. I just left and crashed. But it's the best thing that ever happened in my life. And I like to tell people, a lot of times when tragedies strike you, the first thing you think about is, this is different from my plan. But you got to realize that we were born with a plan already laid out for us. Mm -hmm. And our job is to find out what that plan is. Now, I see myself as an eternal being. I don't believe there ever was a time that I did not exist. And I don't believe there will ever be a time when I won't exist. So I feel that I'm an angel. I feel that I'm the highest of everything that's ever been ex on this planet. And at the same time, I'm the least of everyone. I don't have to be better than people. But I have observed in my 82 years a game to keep people crippled by a lack of knowledge of who they are and what it means to be who they are. Now, knowing you, Gloria, you have attended our melanin conference, <clears throat> and you know our lecture on the brain and the hearing process in 1991 in Dallas. Uh, I've also carried and extended that knowledge every year since then with research. But it was simple for me to go into the hospitals and go in their libraries. There are many papers written that's never revealed to the public. And the one thing I want to put out here is why don't the scientists say what they know? They know the difference in our body and the European. They know that we hear better. They know that we see better. They know that our skin is thicker. 
they know that there are things that come from our environmental development that resonates from us being the fathers and mothers of humanity. So if we existed all that time in Africa and perfected our existence through many forms of culture and then spread it out to the world, how is it that we wind up on the bottom here <laughs> in, 20, in 2009? Well, it's because people have consistently used information and the lack of information as a tool to keep us subservient to them. Because in the 1600s, the European community redefined everything in life that they learned. Agriculture, astronomy, all of the sciences. They learned this and it focused in the 1600s and took credit. You'd study any book and it starts out in the 16 or 1700s talking about some European. Or you come down to genetics, you gotta go to Burbank in California, you know. Uh, there are so many references to the great white race that saved us with knowledge and information, and yet this society is collapsing because of ignorance. And they are in charge, they can't put it on us as much as they try, but this is their failure, it's not ours. And the failure is that they did not tap the resources of intelligent minds. I feel that they should have given me uh, a scholarship and I would have put some uh, discoveries on the table because that was my intent. In uh, my class, when we came up, we wanted to save the world. But we didn't, get, they did not allow us to have the tools to do that with. And so it was a blessing because I had to go and find my own tools. Language was the key. When I came out of the South, I spoke flat, that's what they call it. And see, this was in 1936 when I came to Missouri to go to grade school. The kids like, ah, ha, 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 but I'm a bull. And so it made me mad. It, <laughs> I didn't feel hurt. I was mad. And so I began to ace them in every subject and every sport, everything I did, I would try to beat everybody. <laughs> and so it was that, that energy that made me, uh, try to find excellence in everything I do. So I'm grateful for that. But a lot of people were crushed by it. And I say this to those who may be sad this day, you really should get down on your knees and thank your ancestors that they gave you the best blood on the planet, mm -hmm. that you are the recipient of every gift that any intelligent person would want. You already have it. You don't have to obtain it. You've got it and it's in your soul. Quit looking outside for everything mm -hmm. and start looking inside. See, I was guided inside and inside I learned about the birds. I took, I know that Africans had totems, so I said, let me get some totems. And I got the night hawk. I realized a night hawk had been pursuing me ever since I was maybe five or six years old. I remember them in the sky flying on my birthdays. And then I related to the night hawks and I studied them. Then I got into the sea girls from going to the lakefront and I realized how the sea girls, and even this morning when I went to the sunrise, they always feel my energy and they acknowledge it because in me is a spin that's in all African people if you awaken it. And that spin relates to everything in existence, including this new spot that's on Jupiter out there, including all of the the core of the earth, everything that is moving in life is a part of the African spirit. And so we don't have to go into details and try to push this back or build this up or nothing. All we gotta do is discover what part of the puzzle do we fit. That's all I have to say. You know, I, I, <laughs> I always appreciate your, your perspective. <laughs> on everything, but you said something that tied right in mm -hmm. to something Mama Edie had said, because she remembered these Tarzan movies, <laughs> and you said, we have <coughs> everything <coughs> already, it's already inside of mm -hmm. us, but we are taught, mm -hmm. directed to look outside mm -hmm. of ourselves, 
nothing that we have you know is, is regarded as adequate. No. Let, it, let alone, you know, excellent, but not even, it's, it's inferior, it's not even equal, it's not adequate. That's all right, there's a difference. And so the difference must be defined as we are inferior and they are superior. Exactly. There is a definite difference that any fool can detect at every level. Mm -hmm. Our little children, how soon they uh, begin to walk and talk and do all things, the diseases. I mean, there are so many areas in our daily life that must redefine, be defined as us being sick and decrepit and everything else, like the killings, the shootings that are magnified. I remember when it started. I saw how it started. Mm -hmm. I know who's responsible. Anybody can stop and think how this got mm -hmm. to be. Mm -hmm. It didn't just spring up because in Africa mm -hmm. we didn't do that, mm -hmm. even though they're doing it over there now. That is not the ancient way. In fact, I have very little respect for the present day African because they are not as alert as to who is in their favor and who ain't as we are. We're going to have to teach them. And I want you to understand one thing. This language that we have is alive in every people. That's one of the things that Michael Jackson put on the planet and other people like him. The, our music went to everybody. People in Turkey singing our song don't know the language meaning, but they singing it with our dialect. There are people in Argentina, there are people in Brazil, there are people all over the world that accept our songs because of the spin that's in our music. Now, let's look at what uh, the circumstances are. Here on TV, how many black musicians or people like Phil Coran appear on television? Very, very seldom. I, in fact, I have to turn my TV off in the morning when I'm looking at Good Morning or some of these programs because they have some nothing people on there performing that I wouldn't, you know, I just turn the TV off. I can't stand it to see. And I said one of the things I charge white people with is the pain I've had to endure all my life listening to their putrid efforts at our music. They never one time come and ask me or anybody who has studied, am I doing it right? They never ask. They always tell me or they put it out there. Well, I want to tell you right now, I want to announce to the world, you cannot do it because there's something inside of us that's connected that you are not connected to. And if you ever learn to get connected to it, I'll be the first to congratulate you, but I have not seen it yet. You know, I wanted, yes, wait, I don't know how much more time we have left, but I, mm -hmm. I wanted to mention, tie in, you were saying that we were going in the wrong direction. Yeah. Actually, this piece about communication has yeah. many different dimensions, <laughs> right. and it's all a part of it. Yeah. And, um, and so those dimensions that you mentioned were other parts, okay, um, other parts of it. And the thing is, like, when you were saying that, um, that uh, the Africans yeah. were, uh, they should be, te you know, we were not going to need to teach them. Yeah, Part of to. the problem is that when we talk about how well indoctrinated we've all been, yeah. um, this is clearly a global phenomenon. Uh -huh. yes. And what has happened mm -hmm. is that, for example, continental Africans have been looking to us for our example, which was one of the ways that they made some of the movement that they made, they started dressing like us mm -hmm. and they started doing many things like we did. But then what happened was that when we started falling under, more deeply under the influence of, um, of unconsciousness and started going to sleep, we started manifesting something else that wasn't healthy and they picked that up too. Yes. And subsequently, every time I go to the continent, I see that they're going further and further back. I walk down the mm -hmm. roads and I smell mm -hmm. more hair burning. Yeah. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And it's and that's distressing. So mm -hmm. the idea and, and we had talked about this at your house, the yeah. idea of sending I mean, I was 17, 18 years old when I went to college right. and what have you. And I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to go. Mm -hmm. But at that age, I didn't have the wherewithal. I had the wherewithal to know that I needed something more than they were providing. Yeah. 
which was what prompted us to say we need to get these black studies programs going. Mm -hmm. But for, for African countries to end up, when they call themselves sending their children to, uh, to a university to get a higher education, they end up sending them to the very countries that conquered them in the first place. And so, we, you know, we are consistently putting our, the, the minds, the development of the minds of our children and people who conquered them, you know, in the first place. And I tell you what, mm -hmm. we, they keep waving yeah, cues to me. Yeah. Um, I, I can see that this is limitless. Right. It this is. is the, it's we a have huge just, area. We, we, this is unfathomable. We don't know yeah. how deep this rabbit, to, to, <laughs> we can go down this yeah, rabbit hole. It can spin. But it's important <laughs> that we understand that what we're doing here now is representing communication yeah. yes. because here we are you know my whole thing is is my theme song by uh, Kwame Steve Cobb Kabbalah mm -hmm. records indicates Umoja is, is the, the message, message. Call we unity. got to get the message That's so right. no matter whether or not we are you know on the same page we mm -hmm. got to be headed in the direction. We have to be headed toward each other mm -hmm. and not away from each other. We, we have to uh, mm -hmm. have to uh, to have to, like to have a statement. full dialogue uh -huh. around whatever subject we need mm -hmm. to to discuss because we need yeah. to understand mm -hmm. that we have been. I don't like to even use the term miseducated. We have been diseducated or mm -hmm. deeducated. We have have Hood been reduced rather than <laughs> elevated. And so there's a lot more that can be said and we yeah. will. I would just like to clear up some of my statements because they're very strong. But the, everything I said was true. Mm -hmm. And I know the difference between truth and falseness mm -hmm. is that truth stands with all challenges mm -hmm. and falseness falls away from a few. Mm -hmm. But I'd like for people to understand that when I condemn the people who identify themselves as white, as being responsible for a lot of our ills. And starting with slavery that they try to push under the rug or deny it, just as though everyone else has been given reparations because they'll do them, but we are not. We've never found out why we are not due reparations. But I'm not concerned about that. What I'm concerned about is we have, through communication, have become one world. And lies will not stand in the world where we all face one another now. And so it is time that we deal with the truth in its barest sense and patch our world up based on truth of not only our people, but every people. Mm -hmm. I don't hate anybody. Somebody might think because I speak of European people uh, who identify themselves as white the way I do that I dislike them. I dislike their practices. I don't dislike any people. You see, I dislike the practices of, of black people. And I want to point out something. We throw that word black out carelessly. Black was submitted by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad because it meant consciousness. It did not mean that you, it was your color. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It meant that you knew you were somebody before you got here. Mm -hmm. And so that's what black is. Mm -hmm. It's identifying with your eternity. Mm -hmm. It ain't got nothing to do with your color. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm certain that you have had the last word on this show. And perhaps we'll be Any able show. to come back <laughs> and be able to uh, have some more words along this line. I thank you so much, Mama Edie, storyteller. Mm -hmm. I wish thank you had gotten a chance to do the shake array and told, yeah. tell one of your stories. Yeah. But no, there's going to be another time. I'm not going anywhere. Yeah.